Welcome everybody to the fourth chapter of the Crystal Clear Electronics videos. We will show you the fourth chapter called Laboratory Power Supply and Breadboard in two shorter videos. Our presenter today is Viktor Vince. Thank you David very much for the introduction. Today's video is special because we are the only siblings amongst the presenters. Although David is a mechanical engineer, he has many connections to electronics, but I'm only one of them. As a welding engineer, he works every day with a very special power supply, the welding transformer. David, can you tell us a few words about this device? The welding transformer is a power supply that can provide high amperage up to several hundred amps. This is necessary to ensure that the heat of the arc created during welding melts the material to be welded, allowing the metal pieces to bond together. The transformer's role is to provide high current at low voltage, which is essential during the welding process. The fourth chapter was written by Boton Chateau while he was a BA student, now he is currently doing his PhD at the Budapest University of Technology and Economics. Let's start with the introduction of the breadboard. If you want to build a circuit, you can do it clearly and simply with the help of a breadboard designed for this specific purpose. The figure shows that small holes can be found on the breadboard, where you can push the ends of pins of the components. These holes, as shown in the figure, are connected to the small metal rails embedded in the plastic. David, can you show them? Of course. Here you can see an empty breadboard. On the other side you can see an assembled one with the back removed to show the metal rails. The line of holes adjacent to the two longer edges of the breadboard are called power rails and their polarity is usually indicated by the manufacturers. For the sake of simplicity, the pair of adjacent positive and negative power strips are often referred to as a power rail only. The power rails are not in electrical contact with each other. This is also indicated by the interruption of the polarity marking. You can connect the power supply terminals to the power rails up to four different terminal voltages for the breadboard as shown in the figure. However, there are breadboards that have only one longer power rail per side, therefore not four, but only two different voltage sources can be connected. Before you use it, you should know what type you have in your hand, so it won't trick you. That's right. I'm sure we've all been fooled by an unspecified breadboard. We can define rows and columns in the middle partition between the two sidewise power rails. The holes which are perpendicular to the longer sides, are connected together and called columns, usually marked with numbers. At the same distance, parallel with the longer sides, the electrically non-interconnected holes are called rows. Generally, rows are marked with capital letters by the manufacturers. The breadboard is divided by the longitudinal growth in the center, separation part, into two separate areas. These areas are not electrically interconnected. You can also see these names in the figure. This may seem complicated at first, but it shouldn't scare you. As soon as you start using the breadboard, its structure becomes immediately clear. Let's take a look at a simple setup. This circuit will only consist of a resistor, an IC and a wire. In this case, its function is irrelevant. The purpose is to present how to place it correctly on the breadboard. You should observe that the black flat IC with six pins, which will be discussed later in detail, are plugged into the breadboard so that their pins are not connected through the panel. The three to three pins on the two longitudinal sides fall on the different sides of the separating groove. Note that such multi-pinned components must always be planted into the breadboard in this way. The pins of the IC are placed in separate columns and are not electrically interconnected. If several pins were in the same column, you would short circuit their terminals, so you probably wouldn't be able to connect it to the power supply to properly work, or the IC would even suffer permanent damage. You should also pay attention to the placement of the two pinned parts. Since connecting these terminals is pointless, they should be pressed into two separate columns. When you aim to establish an electrical contact, the wires or legs to be connected must be placed in the same column. The components we've seen so far have been easily placed on the breadboard because they all had pins, 
but not only these types exist. Let's look at this issue in more detail. Previously, we got to know how to make connections on the breadboard, but there are also other ways to build a circuit. What do you think? When can we use circuits built on the breadboard? Certainly not in moving mechanics or industrial use. Well, no. But for prototyping and quick testing of simple concepts, this is the best solution. If you need many pieces of something, or you need it to work reliably in an industrial environment, then most often, components are placed on a so-called printed circuit board, PCB for short. PCBs consist of a carrier and conducting strips, which connect the individual components as desired. The carrier coal substrate is most often made of fiberglass material, while the conducting strips are generally made of copper. The PCB, printed circuit board structure, can be very diverse. The easiest construction is to put conducting strips on one side of the substrate. In this case, the side of the board where the conducting strips are located is called the solder side, the other side is called the component side. It is often the case that conductive strips are placed on both sides of the carrier plate. They are the so-called double-sided or two-layer PCBs. In their case, it is not possible to conceptually isolate the component side from the solder side. It's not rare that conductive tracks are placed in the inner layers of the substrate. These are called the multi-layer PCBs. In the case of two-sided or multi-layer PCBs, the electrical contact between the conductive surfaces is ensured by drilled holes coated with conductive layer, with a foreign word, galvanized. Today's high-class PCBs may contain 14 or more layers. The components are manufactured with different outlet terminals and can be attached to PCBs in different ways. Fortunately, David always has some components. Can you please show them? Of course. When a component has long legs, metal holes are made into the substrate to ensure the electrical connection and to make it capable of soldering the component. These are called through-hole or TH components. The other possibility, if the component does not have long terminals. They are soldered directly to the contact surfaces, they are the so-called pads, created on the conducting layer. These are called surface-mounted devices, or SMDs for short. The great advantage of using surface-mounted components is space saving, so these are more common building elements for the physical implementation of circuits. Most of the components are available in both through-hole and surface-mounted form. The breadboard can be used to fix the through-hole components, that's why we will mostly use such components to build our circuits. Can you talk a little bit about how you know what should be attached to which lead of a multi-lead component? Of course! Always read the datasheet provided by the manufacturer. In most cases, these are available on the internet in English. You can also find descriptions of the components mentioned in this tutorial on the website. If you look up such a specification, you will see that the component leads are numbered, and next to the numbers are written their functions. Manufacturers mark the first lead or pin in several ways. The most widespread mode is a dot on the case. Another commonly used marking technique is using a semicircular groove on one side of the component's package. If you put the IC in front of you and the grooving is at the top, the top left lead is the pin number one. Some manufacturers use a line instead of grooving, in which case pin number one is defined similarly to the previous version. Perhaps the most enchanted way of marking is when one side of the IC is chamfered. It looks like as one side of the IC has been filed. If you encounter such a thing, you should also put the multi-lead stuff on the table standing on its own leads with the filed side from your left. Then the top left lead is the pin 1. If we have found pin 1, then the numbering is identified by a unified system. If you put the IC in front of you on the table, then the numbering moves from the first lead counterclockwise, right to left, in ascending order.
Jobbról balra halad a számozás növekvő sorrendben. I think we have come to the end of the first part. Thank you all for your attention. We look forward to seeing you in the next video where we'll put the knowledge we've just learned into practice. See you until then. Bye!